morning, everyone. I'm Nafemi. And we want to welcome you both in person and those joining virtually to the Oshawa Temple on this Sunday morning. In an effort to continue protecting one another from this season's viruses, we will not be passing the collection plates during our worship services. Instead, we will provide collection plates at the back doors of the sanctuary and by the doors in the fellowship room for your contributions. We will take time at the end of our service each week to pray over these offerings. We are looking forward to our Easter ministry at Oshawa and the plans for the Saturday, March 30th Easter extravaganza are underway. This event, which takes place from 10 to 11.30 a.m., will include games, an Easter um, egg scavenger hunt, treats, crafts, and more. We are currently looking for volunteers to help with this community event. If you can assist, please connect with Susan McVetty, Dave Corrigan, or Victoria Reed. Victoria will be collecting donations of individual wrapped chocolate eggs for the Easter egg hunt at the Easter extravaganza. Donations can be left in the office until March 20th. The best way to keep up to date with all activities at the church and to double check details relating to announcement is to be sure to read the weekly news in the bulletin at www.saoshua.ca slash bulletin. As we turn our hearts and minds to God's word and the encounters with Jesus that shook people to their core, we ask if we are willing to give up everything that Jesus asks of us in order to follow him. Good morning. It's great to be in God's house this morning and we're so glad that you've chosen uh, to come and worship with us. Um, this, uh, or today, we are highlighting Call and Commitment Sunday, and uh, for those of you that have been around the Army a long time, you can keep listening. It's not just about officership, it's about uh, what God is calling you to, um, even if that is officership. Uh, so we're going to highlight that this morning, Call and Commitment and what God is calling us to. We'll see it in our passage of scripture, and we're gonna see it this morning as we start with our call to worship. That's a responsive reading by Lieutenant Adrian Cartmel. So I'd invite you to respond where it says response. Call is an awesome word. It rings of the divine and smacks of destiny. It is the thing we feel we can't avoid doing even when we didn't want to do it in the first place. Everybody has a call to something. Some call it the priesthood of believers. Some call it the will of God for us. Some call it co-creation. We have each been born with particular gifts of mind and soul, of body and brain, of personality and skill that we are meant to use for the greater good. There is no such thing as not having a call. As we worship God together today, may our ears be open to the leading of the Spirit. May we open up our hearts and minds to the possibilities of calling. As Isaiah stood in the heavenly temple, the question was asked, who shall I send? Send us, Lord. With our gifts and our hang-ups, our shortcomings and triumphs, with all that we are, with all that we have, send me. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you today and make ourselves available. You speak in rushing winds, fiery bushes, and small whispers. However, you choose to make yourself known to us today. May we hear, feel, and sense you. You have given each of us a calling, each one different, 
each one important. Help us to set aside the things that hold us back and go forward with you into the unknown, trusting that you will guide and lead us. Here we are, Lord. We are listening. Amen and amen. We're going to invite the worship team to come and lead us in worship. And I would invite you to just have freedom in worship uh, because we are worshiping the Almighty and he is worthy of all that worship that we have for it. Let us let that just bubble up uh, in true praise to him this morning. Good morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with us and sing, He is the Lord and He reigns on high. Feel free to put your hands together as we sing this uplifting song of praise this morning. great sing this morning. I'm going to get you to remain standing. Uh, last week we introduced a new song to you, I Speak Jesus. This song is a reminder that amid life's challenges, uncertainties, and fears, there's a name that can bring peace, healing, and salvation. As you meditate on the words of I Speak Jesus, consider the situations in your life that need a touch from the Savior. It could be a personal struggle, a challenge at work, or perhaps a loved one in need. Instead of being overwhelmed by the situation, make a deliberate choice to speak Jesus over it. May our lips continuously echo the name above all names, finding in its strength, solace, and a never-ending present help in times of need. I speak Jesus. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak 
Sometimes it's hard to speak the name of Jesus, hard to lift our eyes above circumstances, to focus on the goodness of God. But he remains the same today as he was yesterday and all of our tomorrows. He is faithful and his mercy and grace never fails. God is good in all of our circumstances. I've been held in your hands From 
the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see of the goodness of God that all your life God has been faithful and that he's so, so good. We serve a faithful God and we are gonna talk a little bit more um, about that a little bit later. Um, and so I would invite you to start thinking about where you have seen God's faithfulness in your life and perhaps something that you wanna share with the group uh, because there is an encouragement that takes place when we share about how God has been faithful in our lives. Other people can see it in theirs. So start thinking about that because we are gonna have a bit of a testimony time a little bit later where we will invite you to share some of those things. For right now, we're going to look into God's word and uh, we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. Um, if you have a paper Bible with you, you'll find Matthew in the New Testament. Uh, it'll be after Malachi. If you get to Mark, you've gone too far. And uh, just your weekly reminder that if you don't have a paper copy and you want one, come and speak with me. We love putting the word of God in people's hands. I have a couple copies uh, in my office that I'd be happy to pass on to you. You could also find apps and stuff if you need help with that. We're happy to do that too. Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 16. This is what God's word says. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? 
Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What a challenging passage of scripture, but one that I know God will use to challenge us as well as we dig into that. Good morning. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna invite the children to come on up to the front row. And all of my teens who I've asked to help, you know who you are. Oh, everyone's good? Yeah, you guys can just stand here. Okay, so you're probably wondering why I've asked the teens to help, but they're very capable leaders, each and every one of them, and the other ones who didn't want to participate today. Anyways, last week, do we remember what we talked about? Anything, maybe? Talked about Valentine's Day, but we, I remember how I gave you those little Valentines and how, yes. Yeah, there was a lot of them, right? And it was different scripture verses than it said, God says you are chosen, God says you are loved, God says you are blessed, God says you are unique. So just like all that scripture, I have something, a little treat today. You're probably, I guess my bag is a little full here. I have some more treats today because we're still gonna talk about Valentine's and scripture. So first and foremost, I'm gonna, hmm, what's easier to do? Actually, let's ask, I'm gonna ask you guys another question. What kind of treats do we get on Valentine's Day? Yes. Candy, chocolate, cinnamon hearts, some of my favorites. Um, but there's one in particular that's really my favorite, and you might notice what the teens are holding. Can anybody, does anybody know what they're called? It's a speci specific word or words. Emery? Love hearts, conversation hearts, and they all have different sayings on them. There's a whole bunch of them. The ones that I had got, there's a whole, oops, that's the wrong thing. Um, Excuse me while I pick through my Mary Poppins bag here. Um, I have a little goodie for you each. So, each has some scripture on it that goes with each of our candy hearts. So I am going to quickly hand these out. Oh, one for you, one for you. One for you. And each of my teens, they each have one of these hearts and they, what they're gonna do is they're going to read one of the scriptures, and I think we are one shape, or one, sorry, one heart short. So you're gonna have to find, figure out which one it is, and you're gonna have to look it up yourselves. But every time you see one of these conversation hearts, you can be reminded that each scripture has to do with a conversation with God. So I'm gonna read the first one. I can, there we go. So mine is be mine. It says be mine, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this verse is about how God's love is the ultimate be mine declaration. Okay, so I'm going to ask Baruch to go next. Be good, Micah 6 verse eight. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This verse, guides us on what is truly good in the eyes of the Lord to act justly, show mercy to others, and walk humbly every day of our lives. All mine, John 10, 27 to 30. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given me them, them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and, my, and the Father are one. This verse tells us that we have safety and security in following God. We are all His. Call me, call to me, and I will always I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. This verse invites us to connect with God and speak with Him through prayer, while also telling us the promise that He listens to us and reveals things to us when we pray. Love me, Luke 10, verse 27. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. This verse reminds us of the commandment to love God and others wholeheartedly. Forever love, Jeremiah 31, verse three. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. This verse tells us of the enduring and unfailing nature of God's love and how it lasts forever. Sweet talk, Proverbs sixteen twenty four. Gracious words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. 
This verse reminds us that just as the honeycomb is sweet, our words should also be sweet with positivity and grace. Perfect. Can we give a round of applause to our teams? Because it could be scary to be up here. It could be a little bit nerve-wracking to be up here. So thank you very much, teams. So, children, next time you eat the, if you eat all, I think I put six in there, so if you eat those ones, next time, maybe during Valentine's Day when you get some from your friends, you can look at them and you can say, how can this relate to me and how can it relate to God or scripture? Because there's a whole bunch of the ones there, there's eight different versions there, but I know that Candy Hearts have a plethora, many, many, many different messages on there, so. That's something for you to look forward to for Valentine's Day. So we're gonna say a quick prayer, and normally we go out, but we're gonna stay in because we're gonna hear a few testimonies this morning. It's very exciting. And when you see me leave during one of the songs, then we'll go out to Kids Church, okay? Sounds good? Okay, let's bow our heads and we're gonna say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the sweet, sweet messages that you have placed on our hearts today. Thank you for each of our children and our teens and for our family. Uh, at church, and I pray that we have a wonderful day and that you remind us of those sweet messages. And I pray this in your name, amen. Okay, so we can all go sit back with our families. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thank you to the band uh, and songsters for their ministry this morning. What a blessing it is uh, to have people using their gifts to lift up the name of Jesus and uh, sing praises to him so, um, and play praises to him. So thank you all for your ministry this morning. Uh, we are gonna uh, sing a song um, that says, what a work the Lord has done by his saving grace. Let us praise him, everyone, in his holy place. He has saved us gloriously, let us onward, faithfully, yet he promised we should see even greater things. I'm gonna invite you to stand with me if you are able, and uh, we're gonna sing the first verse in the chorus, and then if you would like to share uh, what God has done in your life where you have seen his faithfulness, uh, we'll invite you to stay standing, and I have two mic holders that'll uh, be in each aisle, and they'll come so that we can all hear you. I am going to encourage you to keep it to one, maybe two sentences. If you get to three, we may have to kind of sing you down a little bit, because uh, we want to hear from as many people as possible um, about what God is doing in your life where you have seen his faithfulness. So you can be thinking about that as we sing this first verse, and if you would like to share, you can remain standing uh, after that. So let's, with the help of the band, sing the first verse in the chorus. I would invite you to remain standing if you would like to share, and if not, you can take a seat. And you can wait until someone with the mic, oh, not everyone's sitting down, this is terrible. I know we serve a faithful God, so I know there are people that wanna share. Here we go, Lee's gonna come down with the mic. any case, I'm thinking back to one episode in my life, and I want to tell everybody that once you have known the Lord and given your life to Him, you can't run away. Mm -hmm. You cannot run away from the Lord. Yeah. There's a phrase that people use sometimes that tell us that the Lord is the hound of heaven. Mm -hmm. And I've proven that to be true because I tried to run away mm -hmm. and I couldn't run away. Yeah. He followed after me. He told me that where I needed to be, and that was back in the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. I was brought up in the Salvation Army when we first came to Canada. I got away from it. I'm sorry that I ever did. I tried some other churches, nothing satisfied. Yeah. I finally said to my wife, Liz, one day I said to her, I says, you know, I says, I honestly feel deep in my heart that the Lord wants me back in the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to do there yet. Yeah. You know, he hasn't made anything abundantly clear to me. Mm -hmm. I pray for others. I do what I feel the Lord is asking me to do. So, like I said, don't think for one minute that you can ever run away yeah. from God. Beautiful. Because he'll come after you. Yeah. And he'll bring you back. Yeah. And that you. was a blessed day for me. Yeah. Bless you. Well, we're glad you're back. And we're glad that you listened. Thank you.
Anyone else? Where have you seen God's faithfulness in your life? There we go. Over on the side. Here comes Suzanne. <laughs> it's a big sanctuary, so nothing but grace as you get over there. Sure, I wasn't going to share anything, but um, I think that I see God's faithfulness and his consistency with me. And just how, like, no matter where my emotions or my feelings lead me, whether wherever it's taking me, like, God is consistent and, like, a mm. firm foundation that I've always been able to stand on and trust since I've, like, come to really know him. So Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, he is that firm foundation, that cornerstone. Beautiful. Anyone else? Kate, Suzanne, Kate at the back there. Oh, yeah, swing by Joy first and then we'll go back to Kate. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. How could I not stand up and say how faithful God has been all my life, and especially in the last two years? Yeah. I thank you for your prayers. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we see God's faithfulness in his people, don't we, who lift us up in prayer. Thank you, Joy. What a beautiful testimony. Yeah. There's a song um, that says, I see the evidence of your goodness all over mm -hmm. my life. And I would just testify to that this morning. Most recently, um, some people know I've had a journey with my mom and her husband as they've aged. And my mom has become the primary caregiver for her husband, which has been very, very challenging. She lives in Port Hope and God placed me at the Cobra Hospital so that I could be there 10 minutes from her just to support her over this last year. And I'm here to testify to his goodness and to say thank you to this church for your prayers. They have sustained me when I was at the end of myself. And I'm happy to say in December, you know, couldn't have been a busier time, but we moved my mom and her husband into the same building that mm. Rod's mom is in. So Beautiful. God is good yeah. all the time. All the time. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, we don't believe in coincidence, do we? It's all God orchestrated. And yeah, thank you for sharing. Anyone else? I'll give one more opportunity. Here we go. So it's kind of in the middle. So Suzanne or Lee, whichever one gets there first. <laughs> there we go. Here comes Lee. There we go. So it's coming behind you. He's going to pass. There you go. Beautiful. Good morning, everyone. I can't stand here this morning. Not to say that God hasn't been faithful to me. Mm -hmm. But he has been faithful to me. Yeah. I just like Joy said. He's been more than ever before. God yeah. has been so good. And I just wanted to say thank him for my family and my friends and for bringing me into this core. For my friends, I'm going to say thank you. And I love each and every one of you. God bless you all. Yeah, thank you. We're so glad you're here, and God is faithful, and I'm so glad you could see his goodness in your life. We're going to sing that uh, second verse. Now, if you're sitting here saying, I should have stood up and I should have shared, we're going to give you one more opportunity. So um, if you felt God calling last time, you still have an opportunity between the second and third verse. So with the band, let's sing. Uh, you can remain seated as we sing the second verse together. to share where you see God's faithfulness in your life. Band, you're also welcome. Lee will gladly come up here if you need to. 
Oh, up here. Well, God is faithful every moment if we open ourselves up to realize and to see it. Um, I also believe in divine moments and divine appointments. Do you? Mm -hmm. I I do. And I'm going to tell you one that that just occurred in the last couple of months. And I don't know if any of you and all of you have met Frank and his beautiful family here who sits in the third row and have been coming for many months. But we had an opportunity in our department at THQ for a short-term contract. We needed some help. And we needed it quickly. And, um, you know, posting a job and interviewing and all of that process, that was going to take a long time. And Frank and his family had come here. Um, They had lived in Etobicoke, I think, right, For, for a year, had moved out here. And he was looking for a job. And I remember the, the week that you introduced us, and it was in that week that I had just gotten approval for this position. And Frank and I uh, met, and of course he went through the interview process and everything. But that was not by accident, no. right? I believe that God met my need, my department's need, and Frank and his family's yeah. need. And how can you even question that, right? I mean, God is good. He provides, and uh, he's a loving God, and he knows our every need, right down to that very little detail. And so I'm thankful for that. Yeah, bless you, yeah. Yeah, faithful God provides what we need. Beautiful. Anyone else over here? Yeah. I praise and thank God for my church family. Beautiful. I praise God the way he has carried me through. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I knew this would happen, but thank you everyone for loving me through everything that I went through. The band is very special. I can hear him playing. Mm -hmm. Songsters, I can hear him with his bass voice. (sighs) Anyway, thank you, and I thank God for all of you. Beautiful. For the... The hugs that I get, um, just everything from everyone. I thank everyone. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, Frank, up here at the front. Um, Good morning, church. Good morning. I just want to um, testify the the glorious ways in, in which God has really been evident in my life. Um, I remember I left my country of birth under very difficult circumstances. And um, when I arrived in the United States of America, I had to make a very difficult decision whether to stay there or come over to Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, I prayed about it, and God answered me and said, uh, you must cross over to Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, just in time, in exactly uh, six months' time, um, I got a call from immigration. They told me that all your papers and all your applications for payment stay in, in Canada has been approved. Wow. And um, I have friends who have been here two, five, two, two to three years, even up to five years, whose papers have not been approved. But my documents were approved in six months. Amen. And when I look back, I say, thank you, God. You made that decision and that yeah. call for me to cross over to Canada. If I had Beautiful. stayed in the United States, probably the documents would not have been uh, approved. Mm-hmm. And again, what Lisa has said, it all testifies to the glorious ways yeah. in which God operates my life. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to have a church community family like this. I feel at home every other time I come yeah. here. Yeah. Your love, your warmth, your support is really appreciated. And I think Beautiful. I'm in the right place. Yeah. Thank you. Glory to God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, we're so glad God is faithful through that journey. Yeah, beautiful. Last opportunity. Oh, one at the back here. God has given us many moments where we've questioned various plans of his, not certain if it's the right movement, if it's the right thing. Um, various things from health concerns to, again, which way we are supposed to be going. And a song, an old one that continues to stick in my mind through all of this is Mm -hmm. 
I'm in his hands. Yeah. Um, which says, the days that I cannot see have all been planned for me, and mm-hmm. his way is best, you see. I'm in his hands. Beautiful. Yeah. Remembering to follow his call and not necessarily what we believe to be his call mm-hmm. is one of those things that can only help us in the long run find him again. Yeah. That's the beauty of uh, God's faithfulness is that he doesn't just call us, but he is with us every step of the way. We are in his hands. Thank you for that reminder. Last chance. Well, I just want to share, um, I've shared several times that officership was not uh, in the plans for me growing up. Uh, They were in God's plans, and I have seen his faithfulness every step of the way, uh, giving me words that I never could have come up with myself, and uh, just marking our path and showing up and being there every step that we needed him to be there. God is faithful. Do you believe that this morning, church? Yeah. God is faithful? Yeah, God is faithful. We're going to sing that last verse uh, together, and I invite you to stand. If you um, didn't share here, but you want to share out in the foyer afterwards, continue to share, because we find hope and encouragement in that as we share what God is doing. So stand with me as you, w- um, if you would. Sing the third verse as the kids go off to kids' church. faithfulness. We thank you for the testimony of your people, those that were spoken, those that were uh, said in our hearts, those that will be shared with us others as we go out uh, and fellowship after the service. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that all our lives, you are there with us, you are guiding us. God, we thank you for who you are. And as your servant comes to speak your words, God, we pray that you would, we would hear your voice speaking through him and that we would open our hearts and minds and souls to receive your Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. Layla leaned over to me in the second verse and said, aren't you going to stand up, Daddy? And I said, well, these people are going to have to listen to me for 30 or 35 minutes, so I'll give everyone else an opportunity first. But I do want to speak just as I start to uh, God's faithfulness. Um, One of the hardest things, I think, for us, especially in making the transition in appointments, is um, every time with the kids. And... Um, just wanting to thank God for his faithfulness and for all of you and the welcome that you've given to to them and helping them be a part of what's going on, taking an interest in them. And so my encouragement to all of you is just that it is seen, it is appreciated, but also to reach out to our kids. It's amazing to see so many beautiful young people here. Find out what they're doing, what they're interested in, who they are, and get to know them and um, embrace them in the same way that I know you are and that you've embraced our kids. Um, And just a couple other things on the faithfulness. I know many people have had questions about what's happening with the anniversary weekend. That schedule will come out this week. Some details are just being finalized. So all of that will be out in the coming days on what will be happening and what we'll be doing. And we're so grateful for um, General Bryan and Commissioner Rosalie Petal who are coming that weekend to, um, to worship with us and to help us celebrate God's faithfulness over the last 140 years and into the future, what he's going to do. And the last is just an opportunity in the coming week for us to um, experience God's goodness. And this is the second of our two planned Sabbath weeks that will run from tomorrow, Monday, till Sunday next week uh, before the service. We will still have a service, so please come next Sunday at 11 o'clock. But 
we received some good feedback after our last one, and so we want you to know that we heard that. And uh, the first was many people saying they needed that time away. And so if that's what you need this week, take that time. Take it to go experience God in nature, wherever you may be, take those opportunities to experience God. The second was there was a desire for a little bit more of a focus to what was going on. And so we've, we will be providing that to you in the coming week. Um, there will be prayer stations set up here throughout the building, in the different spaces uh, in the building. And so we would encourage you to come. The schedule for that was in your bulletin for this week. And uh, more information will come out from the office. And so uh, if you don't get the bulletin and you want to be a part of that uh, Leave us your email afterwards. I think there's little cards in a package in the back of the seats where you can do that or see someone out there and give us your email address so we can get that information to you. And the last was a desire to still be together. That part of the beauty of the church family is coming together and being there to support one another. And so we would say if you want to come and do these prayer stations as a family, come and do them as a family. If you want to come as a group that would normally meet here, whether it's one of our music groups or one of our fellowship groups or our Bible studies, come at that time. But step out of our regular routine and just participate in these prayer stations and be a part of seeing what God is going to say to us in maybe a little bit of a different way over the next week uh, as well. And if you're not able to come into the building, um, every day a devotion will be sent to your emails um, to help you uh, have those conversations perhaps around the dinner table at home uh, before you put your kids to bed or you, you want to call someone to be participating in that as well. So we would encourage you to make use of those resources that will be available next week. So to the message for this morning. I can relate a little to the young person in our story. No, it's not the rich or the ruler part. And unfortunately for me, as I look in the mirror or on the bib at the barber shop when I get my hair cut, it isn't the young part anymore as well. No, the part I can relate to him in the story is the call to being something greater than ourselves, to sacrifice. I was 18 years old the first time I heard a call to officership. The person who shared that call with me was Major Byron Jacobs. For those of you who know him, that's Colleen's father. At the time, I assumed he was telling me that I would make a great officer to get me away from his daughter. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way for him. But that was only just the first time that that call came. Because over the next 10 years, God continued to call. He continued to use other officers, both active and retired, to share that news with me. In hearing it from them, I assumed that they had to do this because they were officers, that they were part of the program, or maybe they got, like, commission for every person that they referred to the training college, which unfortunately is not the case. But at the same time, I did feel this calling was something that while I wasn't answering it, that I needed to explore. And so my decision was that I was just going to get more and more and more involved in my local core. So I took roles in youth leadership. I taught a Sunday school. I was a part of a Sunday school class. I was a part of the band. I ran a community drop-in program for teens. I went on the program committee and all of these other things that I could do to show God that I was offering my life to him in ministry. But at the same time, I could hold on to the part of my life that I wanted to keep for myself. I wanted to live in Hamilton with my family all around me. I wanted to work at Scotiabank because I enjoyed my job and the people that I worked with. Colleen and I, as we got into the later part of that 10 years, had gotten married and had two kids and we would bought a house. I was comfortable in that part of my life. So I was offering Jesus everything at that time, or at least that's what I was telling myself and what I was trying to convince God. Because there was something more that he was calling, what he wanted from me in order to accept the calling on my life. But I was hesitant just as the man in our story is. 
But as we read about him, it didn't start out that way, or so it would seem, because as we open this passage of teaching from Jesus in Matthew's gospel, we read, a man approached him with a question. Now, we don't know much about him other than two things that Matthew tells us and a couple things we can learn as we look at his conversation with Jesus. The first is that he's a young man. In the original language of the text, Matthew used the word neoniscos to describe him. And this would have meant that he was in the age range of somewhere between 21 and 28 years of age. And the second is found in the last four words of the, uh, that Colleen read to us this morning. He had great wealth. Now, we're never told how much he had, where the money came from, or any other details other than just that he had a great deal of wealth. A fact that would have been viewed as a blessing from God to the man and also to the people of his time. His wealth more than likely opened many doors for him, giving him opportunities that others his age would not have been able to to have because of what he'd accumulated. This rich young man had perhaps not heard the word no or been turned away very often from anything in his life to that point. And so he's the one that comes to start this this conversation by asking Jesus a question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus, as he often does his scripture and in these conversations, flips the question back to the young man. But in the wording of his question, we see the basis for the rest of the conversation, the foundation that Jesus is laying for what's to come. Jesus replies, why do you ask me what is good? Jesus asks the question in this way because he has already picked up on what is the main flaw in this young man's thinking. That he is equating goodness, righteousness with human effort that it can be gained by doing things, that it's a human quality, that it can be attained and achieved, that it can be possessed. Jesus knows that goodness is not found in human resources or human efforts. Colleen has used the example in the past to highlight this truth uh, that I believe can be an, an illustration for us, that when our kids are young, we don't need to teach them that when someone takes their toy, that they're to grab it back from them. Or when they're angry that they're to hit them and cause the other person pain in the same way that they're feeling it. But we do need to teach them, generally speaking, or maybe it's just my kids, the ability to share what they have with others. To empathize with the one who doesn't have something. To respond not with their hands or their feet or by biting or whatever it might be, but in conversation and trying to work out the situation that there is a better way that is outside of our nature. And so Jesus, knowing the nature of fallen humanity is not good, continues to try to help the young man understand. And he says, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Commandments that were designed to point the people to what is good. Commandments to remind them that goodness comes from God. And that God is good, Jesus is telling the young man. That the only way to be good is to accept his standards and reflect his character. A reflection that to this point in time was done in the minds of the people by just following those commandments. And so as Jesus shares this with him, the rich young man must have felt the conversation was going pretty well. He'd been blessed by God with great wealth, no doubt, because of how he'd lived and kept those commands. So he was pretty confident in the goodness he, uh, I would imagine, and he says to Jesus, well, which ones, which commandments? And Jesus replies, you should not murder, commit adultery, steal, give false witness. You need to honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Now it's interesting to note that these are all similar in nature. That these commandments that Jesus has lifted off, listed off for the young man are the ones that have, uh, that have to do with human relationships, with the human realm. The ones that have to do with how we treat the people around us. Don't kill other people. Don't steal other people's stuff. Honor your parents. Treat other people the way that you want to be treated. 
And as the young man heard these commandments being shared, I can only imagine the smile that started to cross his face. How it grew each time Jesus mentioned a commandment, going down the list and marking them all off. Check, 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 check. And as Jesus finished the, the list, the young man said to him, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now it's interesting that this is his response to this list that includes the words, you shall not give false testimony. Because I don't want to judge him, but I find it hard to believe that there's any way that this young man had kept all of those things for his entire 21 to 28 years on earth. I'm sure he hadn't killed anyone in the time leading up to this. He probably had never needed to steal anything from anyone else, and he hadn't committed adultery, perhaps. But from there, the list gets a little bit more questionable. Had he really always told the truth? Always honored his parents? Always loved his neighbors, others as himself? Was he even really telling the full truth at that moment to Jesus. He was, if we go back to the original text, because in saying all these I've kept, he wasn't saying that he had been perfect, but that to that point in his life, that he had lived it honoring and obeying those commandments. He had worked to keep them and sought repentance when he didn't to the best of his knowledge and ability. The young man had lived a pretty good life. He was feeling good about his chances of getting that eternal life that he had asked Jesus about. Things were continuing to go his way until Jesus opened his mouth again and gave him one last command. A command that really was a call back to the commandments that Jesus had skipped over in the list that he gave the young man before. The ones that have nothing to do with his relationship and interactions with others but the ones that have to do with his relationship with God. And so he said to the young man, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now it might sound extreme for Jesus to have placed this calling on the life of the young man. This is certainly not something that he required of every other person who he called to follow him before or after in the biblical text. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Matthew himself, some of Jesus' disciples, none of them were asked to go and sell everything, give it to the poor in order to follow him. But none of them had the same relationship to money that this young man did. Jesus knew that in the life of this man standing before him that there was a conflict. It was one he had warned the people about during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 and 24, that this man could not serve two masters, God and money. So Jesus was calling this young man to give up the thing that would hold him back from truly following God's command, from being the person God had created him to be. So this is why Jesus called him in that moment to sell his possessions, to give up his wealth to the poor, to sacrifice that which was most important to him to live for something greater. And Matthew records his response. That when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth that he wasn't willing to part with his earthly riches for heavenly gain, for treasures in heaven, as Jesus had told him. Everything had been going so well until he was challenged in taking that step of faith. Now, we don't know what happened to the young man from this moment on in his life. Whether he kept all his wealth or it went away. Whether he ever regretted his decision what he told people about the conversation he had had with Jesus. Can you believe it? This guy tried to convince me, me, that to be righteous and perfect, I needed to give up all my wealth that God has blessed me with. Or the ways that he tried to rationalize making that decision in his mind or with others. 
Just think of all the good I can do with this money that I've accumulated to help so many more people. And who better to figure out how to use it and where it should be used than me? But what we do see is that on that day, he left unfulfilled in his calling, in the plans for his life because he was unwilling to sacrifice what he had accumulated for what God was providing. A struggle that as I look back, I was in, as I mentioned before, for 10 years in my days as a younger man. But God was not asking me to give up my extensive wealth because I didn't have it. He was asking me to give up something different, to give up my comfort, my safety, my security, and to fully trust in him. He was asking me to give up the life that I wanted for the life that he had planned for me, to leave family and friends, the only place I had ever known as home, the job I enjoyed with the opportunities that they were offering me, the home we had just bought, and the church family who had helped my parents in raising me. God was calling me to take away the safety net of knowing what life was going to be like, having all the questions answered, and to head out with him into the unknown. Now, I've shared before that I am a worrier, so you can imagine the struggle that this was for me, giving up all of that, all of the things I knew or had planned were going to happen, to go wherever, whenever, and for however long God and the Salvation Army would tell me that I had to. And for a long time, I left those conversations with God, walking away sad because I had accumulated a good life that I wasn't willing to give up. But thank God that his persistence is greater than my stubbornness. And he's blessed me more with me with more than just one day. He gave me more than just one conversation to make the choice to sacrifice for him. Because while this life has not been perfect, and between you and I, there are things about the Salvation Army that I don't like or agree with at times. We'll have to cut that part out uh, (laughs) when we leave it up on the internet, I guess. This life has been more than anything I could ever imagine or desire for myself and for my family. I've seen more of this country in 12 years than I had in the 28 years before. I've met amazing people that I never would have been able to meet, who have journeyed with me and I have now journeyed with them through the most difficult and trying moments, and had the privilege in standing beside them in the moments of pure joy and celebration. I wouldn't be here today worshiping with all of you without God's plan for my life. In choosing to sacrifice for God, he has blessed me over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. But friends, it's not a choice that we make just one time and then it's done. The rich young man was not just called on that day to sell everything and give it to the poor. No, there are words at the end of that call that call us to something more. Jesus said, then come, follow me. These words remind us that it's an everyday choice that we must make. One that some days I will admit is harder than others. There have been moments in my officership where in my mind, I have gone back to my cubicle at Scotiabank away from all the people. Or imagined myself walking in the front door of our old house or dreamed of sitting in the pews every Sunday with my family. But God has reminded me over and over again that this life he called me to is so much more than my comfort. There is a different plan for my life and that he required and requires me to sacrifice that every day for him. That he requires that same willingness from each of us. Now, your calling might be different from mine. It might be to be a Salvation Army officer. And if that's the case, I'd love to speak with you about it. I'm sure Colleen would as well, or there are a number of retired officers who can share with you the goodness of God through their time in ministry. 
But even with that, the calling to officership, what God will ask you to give up might be very different than what he asked of me. Or maybe your calling is not to officership, but to full-time ministry or the full-time that you can offer, to being a youth pastor or working for the church or the Salvation Army divisionally or territorially. Perhaps it's to remain in the secular employment you have, but to step outside of your comfort zone, living your faith more freely than you are. Or it's to become involved in a program here at the church, leading a Bible study, helping with the kids' church, doing something that doesn't feel like it comes natural to you. Or it's to sacrifice that comfort of the place where you currently work to offer your gifts and ability to a ministry that God is working, will work for kingdom gain through you, not for earthly treasures, but for heavenly ones. Just as the rich young man's call was to stell and distribute, and what mine was to move on and move away, your calling will be personal as well. But what I can assure you is that it's not a one-time one thing. It's not a momentary obedience. It might shift and change as the years go by, but God has a calling for each of us each and every day to sacrifice for him, to place him above every possession, position, and person in our lives. But to know the calling, we must do what the young man did on that day, what the paralytic man the woman at the well, the disciples, the woman caught, caught in adultery did. We must come and engage in conversation with Jesus. Hear his words through this text, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the words of others around us, the natural wor world, music, or the many other ways that God is going to use to call you personally to what it is that he wants you to do. We must hear him, and then we need to respond. To hear the call and the questions he has for us today and to respond with the fullness of our lives. So friends, as I conclude this, let me be bold enough to ask you the difficult question on his behalf this morning. What is calling, God calling you to do? What is he calling you to sacrifice for him today? And Father, we bow Reminded through this story of your goodness. Reminded through this story that there is a calling, there is a purpose for our lives. That when you ask us for sacrifice, it's not for us to prove something to you, but for us to make room for you to be and to do what it is that you need to be in our lives. To give you that prominence, that place. That, God, you're going you're to call us at times to give away possessions. You're going to ask us at times to give away position or power or people. But there is a purpose for those things. There is a plan for our lives. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will move in this place, that you will continue to, to call and to call and to call and to call and to call until we answer until we realize that we can't do it halfway. That what you're calling us to do is what we need to offer back. God, I thank you for people here who have answered that call, who have answered it to officership, who have answered it to youth leadership, who have answered it to working in ministry through the Salvation Army, through other religious organizations, those who are doing it in the secular world and who are living their lives for you in the place that they work or they go to school or they volunteer. That God, you would continue to speak to them as well to shine more light on that plan, to offer the name of that person to speak to, to embolden them in those moments where it will take courage to speak up. That each of us, that we as a church family, will answer the call to be your light into our community. That we will take up Jesus' offer to come and to follow him whatever that may be. 
In his precious name we pray, amen. We've come to the point of our service where each week we provide some time for reflection and response. For us to take a few moments before we head back out into the world to life to just be in God's presence, to reflect on what we've heard here today, to listen for that voice, to hear that calling. A time where we'll often ask you to consider what it is that God is saying and to respond by coming to this place of prayer. This mercy seat, which at its simplest is just wood and nails, but to us represents something more. For us, it's a visible representation of God's presence, reminding us of the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. In Exodus 25 and 22, it says, There above the cover between the two cherubim, I will meet with you. That this is a meeting place for us with God. Or at times, we'll encourage you to pray where you are, to find someone, to respond at home or when you're listening while out walking the dog. But today I want to challenge you, I want to challenge myself to consider responding in a different way. At the front of the sanctuary on the holiness table here, you'll find these little cards. Their designed purpose, I'll be honest with you, is for calling Commitment Sunday, for people accepting a call to officership. Now don't worry, if you come and fill one out, I'm not going to mail it off to the candidates department, or I won't call Mark and Jody and ask them to come and talk to you. Unless that's the call that you're answering. And then we would like to journey with you into what that can mean in your life. No, we're going to use them for that call, but for any call that you might be experiencing today. To come to this place of prayer and to fill out the card. To pray over it and to leave it there if that's what you need so we can pray over it and we can work to support you. Or maybe it's to take it and to place it in your Bible and bring it with you as a reminder of a commitment, a calling that you've answered today. Now, if you're at home, don't worry. There's a way that you can respond to this calling as well. Perhaps it's taking a slip of paper and writing out these words. I sign this today as a symbol of my commitment to following God's call on my life. First to him and then to what he is asking me to do out of my love for him and sign it, and date it, and keep that with you, or share it with someone that you trust, that you love, that can support you. Or maybe you want to write in the chat on YouTube or Facebook, or send us an email so we can pray with you as you take these next steps. But that today we would choose not to go away sad, or feeling unfulfilled, but choose to sacrifice for him in order to live our lives to the fullest. We're going to sing through... The, uh, the song, This is My Desire, This is My Desire to Honor You. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my life, I give you my all, is what we're going to sing to. And would you consider as we do sing it, what it is that the Lord is saying, the calling that he's placing, and respond by coming or by praying where you are to his leading in your life today. Would you join me as we sing this through a few times this morning?
reality as we pray, as we take these opportunities to just listen to his voice this morning. And then we're gonna sing it through uh, one more time after that. moments grateful for your presence in our life for your faithfulness and for your goodness that you don't give up on us that though we turn from you at times that though we reject your call that we don't answer that we don't respond in the way that we should that we often leave sad and unfulfilled that you continue to passionately persevere after us that you're running after running after me each of my brothers and sisters here, those who are watching or will watch later after each of us as people, that you desire so much a relationship with us that you will run after us, that you never give up, that you are faithful to the end. God, open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to what it is that you are calling us to challenge us to answer that call for today and for tomorrow for each day that you bless us with life to be your people to be your hands and feet offering your love and grace to others to be the voice for those who are voiceless to offer encouragement and love for those who are hurting and desperate continue to reveal to us your plans, your pl plans for us as individuals, as couples, as families, as a church family here at Oshawa Temple. Continue to speak to us, continue to pursue us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna sing through the chorus one more time uh, just before we have our closing song together. Just before we sing our closing uh, song this morning, just a reminder to you of uh, the Sabbath week that is coming and the information that you can find in your uh, email. If you haven't given to us, please do. Um, we will, the, the kettles, we said collection plates, but they're kettles, um, will be by the door on your way out for you to provide your contributions um, if, if you choose to give. And we'll pray over that just following our closing song. 
A song that says these words, Dear Lord, I do surrender myself, my all to thee, my time, my store, my talent, so long withheld by me. I've heard the call for workers, the world's great need I see. Oh, send me to the rescue. I'm here, my Lord, send me. In the chorus, here am I, my Lord, send me. I surrender all to obey thy call. Here am I, my Lord, send me. My prayer is that is the cry of your heart. That is your testimony, that you'll go, you'll do, you'll be what he needs you to be. If you're able to stand, would you uh, join me uh, in standing as we sing through this beautiful song together to conclude our time this morning. that's our prayer that you would send us that you would continue to call us that we would be faithful in responding to that call call us to where we need to go for how long wherever whenever you need us to go and to be and to do and God as we go from this place we take with us that encouragement that you are an active God who's active in this world who's actively still calling people we go to share your light and your love with others And as we leave, as we offer back to you uh, a portion of what you have blessed us with, may we be reminded of your goodness and your faithfulness to us and throughout all generations. Bless those who give, bless those who will receive it. Certainly, God, continue to bless all of the people who um, come to take part in what goes on and whose lives are being impacted and changed And we're seeing evidence of your faithfulness even today. Bless each of us in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Our benediction for this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I pray that you know that faithfulness. If you had your opportunity and will leave here sad and unfulfilled, those cards will be there, and you can come and get one and take it with you if that's what you need. I pray that you will continue to answer that call and go to where it is that he's leading you. Have a blessed week. Go in his peace, love, joy, and hope.